two hours ago and she was planning. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll just wait a couple seconds, just, you know, and we can talk with Scott. Scott, um, well, let's go ahead and start. Let's go ahead and start. Yep. Uh, I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. I'm standing in, Michael McCorkle, Vice Chair. Laura is not able to be here at the moment. And uh, so, Scott, uh, you're the new guy. Would you please um, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Scott Lindeback. I've been uh, with the Cedric County uh, Public Works for the last about seven, eight years. Okay. Uh, I'm the stormwater engineer for uh, Cedric County. Uh, I'm also on the stormwater advisory board for the city of Wichita. So okay. that's the reason why I've been appointed to this, uh, this board. Uh, there, I was the only volunteer. Willing to, willing to, uh, I was wondering if you got the short straw or just crazy. <laughs> I said I'd help if, 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 okay. they, if they needed someone. Uh, but I got a, uh, uh, degree in civil engineering okay. and from K-State. So okay. that's kind of my education background. That right. could be nice. Okay. We're, we're uh, happy not to that it's any of my business, but are you related to Brian? I am. Okay. Uh -huh. he's, he's my younger brother. Oh, cool. Is that right? <laughs> Small world. That's right. There you go. Okay. I'm on the planning commission. So That's my thought. see him okay. many a time. I bet you do. <laughs> I was making sure, did Laura not want to run the meeting today? Is that kind of what you guys agreed upon? Or? Um, Laura, do you want to go ahead and run things? You're right. I can. Um, yeah. yeah I let's can do that. Because, it's better. Since you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, we can hear yeah, you. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I know that you got a sick kid, so I didn't want to impose. I just want to make sure that was discussed before we proceeded. Uh, yeah, please. That's better. We, the, yeah, we, uh, we discussed if the sound didn't work. <laughs> that that Mike would uh, stand in, but since it is working, I can I can help lead the meeting tonight. Um, so really nice to meet you. I think what might be helpful to you as well is to have us introduce ourselves briefly to you as well, um, so that you know who's around the table with you. Um, Michael, why don't you start in the room and then we'll go to to us on the the Zoom afterwards. Okay, um, I'm Michael McCorkle. Uh, it's my privilege to be the vice chair of this board. Um, I'm one of the um, founding members that argued for it and um, believe in it strongly. And um, so I'm sort of a instigator for where we're at right now. And, uh, and I hope we move forward and do positive things for future Wichita's. That's why I'm involved, okay? Okay, Lori Lawrence, I'm representative Brandon Johnson out of district one, city council district one. And I do a whole bunch of environmental things. I'm in, also involved in several other groups like Society of Alternative Resources, Sierra Club, Bag Free Wichita, and more. Um, so this is a really important board for me. So I try to always be here. My name is Deborah Foster. I'm on the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission and I'm their liaison to this committee. Um, I'm Tammy Ray, hey. <laughs> and um, I work. I'm with Evergy, so sort of a representative from the utility. I'm Scott Lindeback, and I'm uh, a uh, board member representing the Stormwater Advisory Board. Uh, Lauren Clary, uh, appointed by Councilmember Ballard, and also work for Kansas Gas Service. That's good. Um, Cody, why don't you go ahead and I'll round out. We've got one more. Just Sign in. Oh. Okay. Sounds good. Is Russell serving? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. Russell, are you on this board now? Advisory yep. Oh, hi. Welcome, Russell. <laughs> All right. That's so good. All right. You're just in time to introduce yourself. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do more than that. I'm Russell. <laughs> hi, Russell Fox, I'm professor at Friends University. Uh, and uh, happy to contribute whatever I can to pursuing greater environmental and fiscal sustainability in the city of Wichita. So, and I'm here because I'm on the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Board. And so I'm taking the place of Jack Brown. And that's Scott. Okay. He's new too. Awesome. Hey, Scott. Scott. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> okay. Um, so Cody just wrote in the chat. Let's see. Um, he's in a loud room, but room, um, but he's Cody Irwin, and it's a pleasure to meet those who we've not yet met to meet. And then um, lastly, I'm Laura Lombard. I'm the the chair of this of this board. Uh, my day job is working for Kansas Global Trade Services, um, but I have also been involved in sustainability and climate work, um, 
either as a volunteer or professionally in the past. I'm also the chair of the um, Climate and Energy Project. Um, so try to try to move these types of issues forward as much as I can um, for the good of our little guys like this who are here with me today, who and the reason I'm not in the room is uh, he's very, very sick. So we are staying away from getting everyone else sick. Um, that all said, um, really glad to have uh, the two of you joining us and great to see a lot of people in the room today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. Um, I'm gonna hand the next part of our agenda over to Penny um, to kind of go over with us the Kansas Open Meeting Act um, as a refresher and why it's important that we follow it. Penny? Hey, thanks, Laura. Um, I did want to take a second to introduce myself for the new members. I'm Penny Price. This is the Director of Public Works and Utilities. I oversee Finance Administration. And um, doing the real work here is Lisette Ortega. She's our new environmental quality specialist. Um, who just joined the city at the beginning of this month. And then Renee Bashman has been helping us in the meantime, she's an expert facilitator. And so actually, if they don't mind, I'm gonna turn the Coleman stuff over to them because they're even better at it than I am. So just kind of run through high level basics so that new board members and old board members alike kind of know what the expectation is and can ask us any questions they might have. Um, so I did hand out and I will start sharing the screen so those online can also see what I handed out and I will, um, I will send this out. Okay, so I will um, email this and I've handed it out to everyone in the room. Um, but just going over some of the basics of court or coma. So this stands for the Kansas Open Meetings Act. This is a required training that you are taking on this board. So for a lot of you, this is just kind of looking over it again, just to remember what is necessary in order to um, be in compliance with coma. So the definition of a meeting is any gathering or assembly in person through the use of a telephone or any other medium for interaction, interactive communication by majority of the membership. Um, so this means any form of communication, email, phone, what we're doing right now. And what it means to have a meeting is basically let it be open for the public. So as we are members of the public, we're serving on a board or you guys are serving on the board for the public. It's just making sure that we're having that interaction. People can see what we're doing, see what you guys are doing and everything to keep it open. So a gathering or assembly is defined um, as the majority of the board. So this will equal a quorum as you guys say it. And then it will also mean you are officially in a meeting. Um, so may conduct meetings by telephone or in a medium, like I mentioned. Um, and this means you have to be in compliance with coma. Informal discussions before, after, or during the recess of a public meeting may be subject to coma. It doesn't matter what you call this meeting. If there's more than, um, Five, six of you, five, there's more than five of you, um, then you are subject to coma. Serial communications are included, which means interactive communications outside of a notice meeting may be meeting under coma if the majority of membership uh, of the public body or agency are sharing a common topic of discussion, are intended by any or all participants to reach an agreement on a matter that requires binding action to be taken by the public body or agency. Emails, calling trees, use of agents, myself, staff member, um, a good tip or a good thing to remember is do not reply all, do not forward. This can be, um, mm. this could be considered a meeting. So like we talked about majority of the membership, the next one number greater than one half, the total number of members, this includes vacancies as well. So, and a discussion is defined as a binding action or voting is not necessary. Meeting includes all gatherings, at all stages of the decision-making process, social gatherings, retreats and meetings held in private, educational and conference and seminar. So this is just a quick little refresher just to remind everyone kind of where coma comes in and where it might not. So we have to have eight people to be the majority of the membership of this board because there are 14 members. So if we have less than eight, we can still visit with each other. I, is that what that means? I think I'm trying to understand. I think it's deep. You know, Renee, it's in it filled seats or, or she said vacancies are included, but that kind of yeah. me too. I thought it was just active. 
I, I believe that it includes the vacancy. Space. Okay, so it is okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So because, less than eight is okay. Because they haven't been filled yet, like we might be in the middle of like what was that uh, was talking about earlier. There is like she's in communication with a couple of um, like entities that still need to appoint and maybe they haven't met yet. So they're like in the process of appointing somebody to that seat. And then it then still has to go to council. So we might be in that like gray area. So it is like even those seats are still considered because okay. we're putting somebody in that seat at a later date because okay. we have to wait for council approval. Well, in the spirit of coma, right, is the opportunity for public input, right? So you guys can absolutely meet. That's what the subcommittees were designed for so that you can continue the work in smaller groups, you know, in between these group meetings. But as the larger group meets, the intent and the spirit is, the spirit is to allow public input, right? So that, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I was just curious about the number. So if we want to share information, some report that we came across that we think is important, we send it to you. Mm -hmm. And you can forward it because yes. then it's part of the public record. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But and we can't just like all happen to show up at the same, you know, Riverfest event and decide <laughs> something. Yeah. Okay, good. So what Any is other? the penalty if we did some more than eight? What, what's the consequences of that? I think you're subject to a fine of $500, I believe. Seriously? Yes. The board is? Or the yes, if there's is? a complaint. A complaint. I'm not sure if it's the board or if it's the person, um, but if there's a complaint about something, um, then you are subject to a fine. I believe that's five hundred dollars. Who can initiate a complaint? Um, any member of the Anyone. public. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any additional questions? No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Okay, so um, next we're going to move to approval of minutes from last month. Um, has everyone had a chance to review those prior to the meeting? Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? A motion they be approved as they are. Okay, and okay, sounds good. Um, all right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right, so moving on to discussion items, and just to kind of note, um, we have changed uh, the the agenda order this time to see how it'll work, but um, we're going straight into business discussion first, and we're going to save public comment um, to the end. Um, that is in hopes that we can get through more of our um, business um, and then use the last 10 to 15 minutes of um, each meeting for public comment going forward. So that's a change to how we've proceeded before. Um, to that end as well, during the, the official discussion, um, I would like to ask all members of the public um, to let us um, have those discussions. Um, and then you can comment on them towards the end, um, again, in the public, in the public section of this. Um, first item, or let me, I guess I'll stop there for a second. Any questions about that? Are you saying the public can't, can't comment during the, any discussion except for the end? For the most part, yes, Jane, because we need to be able to talk as a board. Um, and then at the end, um, we will, we're going to try it for a couple of months and see how it works. Um, and then if that doesn't, if it doesn't work out well, then we'll revise that again. But uh, we need to be able to get through more work than we've been able to do. So that's why we're keeping that. Um, Penny, I'm going to hand it over to you for the first part of the discussion. If you could um, kind of run through the, the block grant. I Laura, you had one question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Say again, Russell. How many board members are here? I don't know everybody. One, two, three, four, five. Two, three, there's four, seven, five. I believe. So there's six. These seven. Two people are staff. Right. Seven. And then there's two more people on camera. Um, are those, Cody and Laura, Laura Cody is a board member. Cody, 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 Cody. Cody and Laura. Board okay, members. so Laura, Cody, Michael, Lori, I'm sorry, Deb, I don't know. Deborah. Deborah, me, Scott, Scott Tammy. 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 So and Laura, 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 Laura. And Laura. Lauren. Okay, so we actually could vote on something today. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and if, and Russell, if we didn't have quorum, we actually wouldn't have the meeting at all. Um, really? So unless, 
unless we have the, the full the full quorum, we're not um, you know we're not allowed to to hold any kind of meeting, whether or not we're voting or not. You can you can hold a meeting, but you can't vote on anything. Okay, well, that's that's different from what we've been told before. Because we were there's times where we thought we weren't going to have quorum and weren't going to be able to have a meeting. Not considered an official. Um, John, stop. Okay, um, Penny, could you could you go over the block grant with everybody? Sure. So um, I'm going to start from the beginning since there are some new board members, but the city of Wichita has been allocated uh, three hundred eighty-one thousand dollars for uh, block from block grant funding. Uh, the application is due in January of 2024. And the city would like this board's input as far as the priorities for that application. And we sent out some information. It was a lot of information, but I think the most valuable thing that we could do today is identify the area of focus. EECBG has five areas of focus that you know we could pursue and each one has its own roadmap. And so I think that if the board could provide some input as far as where it would like to begin, um, that would that'd be helpful to staff. Did you guys have a chance to look, or do you want us to kind of pull up the blueprint, or how would you like to proceed? I looked it over, but I don't off the top of my head remember the five areas of focus very clearly. So yeah, I would like to start over since we have new members. Could you pull up that um, first link, which is the blueprint that we sent out? I would have to log into my email. Okay, while she's doing that, I'll just generally describe them. Um, the first area is energy. When is coming to the block grant? Uh, well, we have to submit the January 24 application. Yeah, but, but to whom? Is this city money, county money, state money, city. national money? City. City money. Okay. Um, so the first area would be energy planning, very broad. Um, second would be efficient buildings within this category includes energy audits and building upgrades, energy savings, performance contracts, um, building electrification campaign, and building performance standards and stretch codes. Uh, the third area was um, renewables, so solar and storage, community solar, solar rise campaign, and then renewable resource planning. Four was electric transportation, including electric vehicles and fleet electrification, also including charging infrastructure for the community. Um, the fifth area was finance, unlocking sustainable financing solutions for energy projects and programs with revolving loan funds. And actually, I lied, there's six, the final being workforce development. I was reading through it and there is a lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, a lot of the opportunities are endless. Yeah. yeah. I can. Could you scroll back up to the solar piece? <laughs> or scroll down, whichever direction it is. And I, and I think I got a little confused about which was in which category because, like, there's energy, there's solar renewables, there's electric transport. To me, those are all like the same category, but there are three separate categories. So in a way, we almost need to look at the, the, the next step down to figure out which area of focus we're actually in, I think. If it helps, and I don't really want the, I was gonna try and hold this back because this is a staff. Um, what we determined as staff before we talk, brought to the board, some ideas that we tossed around were funding for a rebate program to encourage citizens to switch to electric lawn care equipment, which is a program that we have, right? We funded last year, we set aside $10,000. We got about $5,000 in participation. Um, uh, funding to replace gas powered small motor equipment used by the city of Wichita Parks Department would help us identify what part of their small motor fleet they could convert to electric. Um, then money for a citywide emissions inventory. That's something that I think we've actually handled 
differently. We have an ICLE membership and they really help us a lot identify um, how to prepare our own inventory. Um, but that was something we suggested previously. Um, and e just EV charging station. And then we did earmark some for solar projects. But that's what I presented to the manager is, you know, if that was, if this was a city only led effort, option two being engaging the sustainability board. I think that what makes this difficult is the board hasn't necessarily defined any goals yet. You know, we haven't said we want to reduce this by X or this is our priority. Like you said, there's a lot of opportunity in this. There's a lot of opportunity in sustainability itself. Um, so I would think we'd have to identify some goals. Um, and then I know the Economic Development Subcommittee had been talking about green building and energy performance pilots. I'm not sure the status of that, but that's kind of where we settled that in March. We submitted the pre-award information sheet, and so we're eligible for the funding. The application, like I said, is due beginning of next year. Wouldn't the um, green, I don't remember which one it is, the, that the proposal that we had to evaluate one of the buildings like city arts and then decided not to do city arts. Um, that sounds like this is one of the things that this speaks to is using some of that for that um, energy audit of a city building uh, to just get some standards set on what might be able to be done throughout the city. So when I read that, I, I, that's exactly what I thought about was what we had already talked about before. So does that, doesn't that seem like that fits right in there? Yeah, it seems like it fits. <clears throat> Another thing I noticed was that it's in the small print kind of, but this also, some of the things like uh, energy efficiency and weatherization fit, say residential. To me, getting this out to the public is the most important thing. More, as much as getting the buildings retrofitted or whatever we might need to do. That's a concern for me. We've had weatherization programs and SCED, even when you follow, I followed the links on this and it led me to SCED for weatherization programs. Okay. And I don't know how much they're doing along those lines at this point, but that can be really super helpful to people who are losing their heat and air out the out their windows and you know there's a lot of energy efficiency that could be helpful we do have an energy efficiency committee because that is kind of one of our goals is to deal with that so i thought that was an important marker that it does say residential part of the problem with residential is that it only works for homes that are owned rather than that are rented if there was a way to make this applicable, if a landlord said okay, to let them weatherize their house, their next renters would be very happy, and so would the current ones. But is there a way to do something like that? To me, that's a, a huge piece that we could do that would benefit people across the city. Well, and it talks about um, using the Justice 40 initiatives. Is that something that can give you a leg up? And then, you know, if we target those disadvantaged community areas that they mm -hmm. identified for that yeah. weatherization. Exactly. And just as 40, the 40 is supposed to be 40% mm -hmm. is how I read that. So this would be a, a good way to fulfill that. Um, there's also community solar, which now I wish Kent was Jenny was here. Um, there seems to be a way to do that now um, to set up some community solar in neighborhoods. It would be very difficult to do. I mean, it, it's, it would be very difficult to take solar generation and socialize it to a certain number of houses. That would require regulate. I mean, that would require commission approval, regulatory legislative approval. It, it would be hard to do in the state of Kansas today. Yeah, yeah the way it's things are to today. Towards. But that, exactly, that's something that we could work towards is trying to make that kind of a change because the state is not set up. It's a regional monopoly system, period. And it doesn't have to be. Many states are not doing that. So, but this is just another piece of this. Um, putting solar panels on people's roofs are another option, but weatherization is going to come first. Right. It has to come first. We work with SCED on some projects, and they they do they they end up they're doing a lot to try to get more of the money out there. What mm -hmm. they run into, and we gave them a, a grant for it for gap funding because they find 
like before they can get a new furnace, they have to remediate the asbestos that's around their current one. Exactly. And in that, in a low income house, they can't, then they end up not getting the funds because they can't fix the asbestos because they don't have the money to get it. To get it. So but I don't know if you... any of this block grants or this block grant could go to, towards that. That's what I was wondering too, if there was yeah. a way to let it do the remediation of the other stuff so that they could put in an energy efficient heat and air system. Is there a way to back that up? Is there a way to, to, I mean, a big part of the whole replacing your toilet is that your floor is gonna fall through and you can't afford to fix the floor. So you make sure that you're careful when you sit down and you don't replace your toilet because there'll be a big hole and they will not be able to put a new one in. All of this stuff, if there's a way to include the, Right. And I know with, with, with it solar, to be other utilities that have tried to do low income rooftop solar, the problem they run into is the roofs aren't suitable for solar. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, you're looking at the cost of replacing a roof versus the cost of you know, solar. So it rarely works out because this, the roofs and the homes aren't equipped for But that. solar could conceivably go on city buildings. It doesn't have to be on a roof. That. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be. No, but it should be. Right. Should be that, to as it. opposed to taking up green space that could be used for something else. We've got rooftop yeah. space. Lots of empty rooftop yeah. space in the city of Wichita. Lots. And it's usually cheaper if you do rooftop and then, you know, interconnected yeah. that way. It's usually cheaper than a ground mount. So what, do we have to do the 40% for low-income communities and and what's the best way to do that if we have to do that? I mean, maybe we focus on getting rooftop solar to people who aren't low income because they've got roofs that'll actually hold it. But it would still, over the community as a whole, start reducing our carbon emissions and so forth. So I just, I feel like we're getting we're getting stuck in the hole where we can't go anywhere and we have to do something. I, I'm feeling very, we have to do something at this point. I'm being very inarticulate today and I apologize. Okay, back to the, <coughs> we got energy, we got en energy efficient building analysis. We got renewable solar and storage. We got electric transport. And the gas lawn equipment thing, we talked about that some time ago it's one of those, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but the amount of pollution produced by lawn equipment is just <clears throat> unbelievable. And if it's one of those things that if we can change that, it's going to have an outsized impact. So maybe that's one of the things we look at. Um, the okay. finance and workforce de development, I, I admit myself to be totally flummoxed and mm -hmm. I don't know, understand yeah. what anything about any of that. So somebody else is going to have to But I don't think there. we have to do every single piece, right? No, yeah. no. Right. Pick so, one. Yeah. But I'm just saying, I don't even know how to judge whether we should pick the last two, the finance and workforce development. I'm not yeah. quite sure how that even works. Sustainable finance. Like when I see Solarize, I don't know if there's a, there's a program in Kansas City called Solarize KC, and it was a sustainable financing solution that was supposed to be geared toward lower income people who, because solar is expensive. Most people don't have that sort of expendable cash. So they were offering low interest loans to people who qualified by crowdsourcing okay. it. So if you got a hundred homes, then everybody benefited from this lower interest rate and everybody benefited from a lower cost because through their solar as camp KC campaign, they had one vendor, you know, one installer. Oh. So instead of, the money that they may have had in customer acquisition, they were guaranteed okay. you know, 105 KW okay. systems. And so- Now it begins to make sense to me. Right, Thank so you. that would that would probably be defined as a sustainability financing solution that they, that they did um, in Kansas City. What I understood from reading, because there, yeah, there's so many links, you get into a yeah. rabbit hole with yeah. the whole thing. Um, but the workforce stuff, I, I saw, you know, creating programs to help train energy auditors which there's those... a huge need for that in kansas today i talk yeah. I, I have conversations with people all the time mm -hmm. trying to find a certified 
energy auditor in this. And area. there's all these certified yeah. programs that are all on there and they can, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to implement. Yeah, they say that, but nothing right. with, you know. I don't think there's any in this area anymore. There used to be a guy out of Derby. Back years ago, you guys might remember when the Kansas Energy Office did the financing for. Yeah, I did, but I used Mike Watson. Who doesn't do them anymore, does he? He doesn't do them anymore. I don't, I don't so. know. I don't yeah. need to have it done right. again. <laughs> I haven't asked. I think that was a really great program that created jobs and interest but when that money disappeared um i can't i haven't been able to put yeah. customers in contact with anybody doing this anymore. the cost of doing an energy audit for the consumer though is quite high right which is um, where that program offset that cost yeah well sounds kind of like i still have to pay 500 dollars. sounds like an easy need that's defined and yeah. can be addressed and then i was gonna to penny's point about the um the lawn fleet the um, EFC report had a three uh, point benefit cost ratio on inventory and replacement of small motor equipment to electric. So there's something that's in our uh, right. sustainability report. And I think it's um, something that can engage a broader mm -hmm. set of people, I think. I mean, every, many people have to take care of a lawn, even if they're renters, even if they're low income, even if they're high income, everybody's got, you know, a lawnmower somewhere in their life or they're hiring somebody yeah. to have a lawnmower. The, we do have that um, rebate for purchasing electric lawnmowers, mm -hmm. but it's $50. So the cost of an electric lawnmower is not $50. I saw they were on sale at um, uh, Home Depot. Uh, there's a promotion for $350 lawn, uh, electric lawnmower. So 50 bucks is mm -hmm. pretty good. Chunk of that, um, but you have to have 350 to start with because it's a rebate. Mm -hmm. So that makes it difficult, and many, many people won't be able to do it. But it's better than nothing. It's so, already it already exists. Right. So would would we try to increase that amount, or is is that even viable? More than fifty dollars. That's what know. I'm thinking. Yeah. Just I mean, because, I'm just asking the question. But I'll be honest. You got to get the word out. I live in the city. I didn't know there was an electric more rebate to be fair i mean i, I don't think people well, will know come more often my dear i'm here i've been here every time <laughs> but once okay I'm, I'm, when they said in any case said, we failed to yeah. communicate that i mean i'm just saying i don't think people i don't think yeah. people know because I, when I really they set don't. it up it was out there and then since then it's just it's kind just of laying there right so right so it hasn't been getting any exposure since then well, is it in yeah, it's right. an ongoing. is it done over with? well last year was the first year and we started it july one and it ran through the end of the year and we talked about restarting it okay. again this year it but it was the first year and you know that's good feedback because we had to know we allocated a small portion of our air quality budget is that good Last year was not the first year. We got a rebate on getting a water saving dishwasher like four years ago. Right, yeah. so long long more oh. electric lawnmower. Oh, yeah, yeah. That just is separate. right. Now the water's been running for 11 long years. Yeah. We do both in our office, but yeah. last year was the first year for lawn care. The difficult thing about using our air quality grant funds for the lawn care is that EPA requires that you recycle your old mower, which I think is great, but is also a barrier to security. Yeah. So I don't know if this would have the same strings attached or not. But Penny, what were, you were saying there was a staff recommendation. Was that just around um, the city fleet of lawnmowers or was that the rebate? Um, so the fleet would be for like Parks and Rec. They have the most small motor equipment in the city and then separately would be a rebate. So there would be two separate things. And does it cover other lawn like leaf blowers or whatever, or is it just lawn? Yeah, it's all lawn care. What okay. office is the lawn? The, the lawn care rebate program through? So it's in public works utilities. Okay. Is there some means where we could require all of the contractors to be yeah. using electric? That's, yeah, that would, be, that would be huge, but that would also be I mean, they could, we could put them on a timetable, even if they say, oh my God, it'll cost so much, but we could put them on a timetable so that after three years, maybe they have, they, right. everybody has to be doing or it. Or 50% of them have. Or, yeah, fifty percent. I mean, but we can make some step, to... some you know, what, calendar along those lines. One of the legitimate issues they have is just they're out there all day, every day, and they're gonna their batteries are gonna run out. Is what's gonna happen, and they're gonna have they to have a huge number it. of batteries to yeah. be able to get through a day's work. I, you know, it's it's doable. It's it's just there's more in trained energy in a gallon of gas than you know, in I don't know how many 
batteries. Right. So. I mean, that's why we're on, yeah. on a carbon economy. Right. But but for the for the prof I mean, I think we need to do it eventually somehow, but I'm just saying there's going to be a lot of pushback because of that factor, I think. Well, if we, you know, any any reduction is a step in the right direction. Yeah. So if we got to agree to a certain percentage by X, X date, that's a step in the right direction. Well, there's also the them. Who's them? Um, lawn care companies are notoriously small business. They, I don't even know if they have an organization of any kind. I doubt it. But if it. they are contractors for the city, all that's... They have to, be well, they have to meet a certain criteria, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a separate thing. And I'm, I'm talking about the people who just mow lawns for... Right, I'm talking about clients. city contractors. Okay, sorry. I'm on a totally different subject then. I thought you were talking about the, the companies, the lawn care companies. I think one of the great things that, about all of these things is ways to help the city be more efficient which then ripples out into the economy. Maybe over one time. of the first yeah. steps is to work with whatever that contract office is to figure out what the care it would be yeah. that would incentivize them. So that at least as our city contract, we offer there's some offer or some incentive to 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 go green or to go electric. I don't know, again, I don't negotiate contracts yeah. with them, but if there was some incentive that said you've got some sort of priority, you've got some sort of headline, I don't know what it would be. And then we become a city who encourages it by providing contractors this incentive. And then they choose to go or they choose not to, but step one is to let them know we're heading this way. I, I'm, I, I, hey guys. I, I think the, the city staff, lawn care staff would be worth working with because if we can get it, it to work with them, if they can figure out a way to do it efficiently to transition to electric power, then that would give us the model to go to the private businesses. But in the meantime, I think we should focus on individual homeowners or landowners changing out their electric or their lawnmower for an electric mower and the city staff as opposed to the professional lawn care companies. That's all yeah, I'm, I'm not saying. talking about professional lawn care companies. I'm talking about contractors that are contracted by the city. Yeah. And that's, and that's 80% yeah. of the parks in, in the lawn mowing. Yeah. I um, can I break in, guys? So just again, for time's sake, um, Penny, when you and I spoke about this um, a week or two ago, um, kind of we, my understanding was this grant is something we need to determine over the course of the next seven months, correct? Correct. Okay. And what we might want to do is take sections of this each meeting um, to discuss going forward. So you know, looking at this, um, Blueprint 1, 2A, 2B, all are very... Uh, or let's see, maybe one and two, for example, are, are somewhat similar or, you know, kind of look at the different sections and divide them up into categories. So rather than bounce around on all different areas, I think we'd probably get a lot more done um, if we take them into bite sizes over the next, next several months. Does that all make sense to everybody? Because we have seven months to do this, right? Correct. To advise on it. Now, um, Penny, Elizabeth, you know, their team's going to be working on this separate from, from what we discuss, but we can help them with what we would like to see in each of these categories. Um, so what I'd probably suggest for future meetings is that we, you know, we look at each one of these or not, we don't have enough time to do each one for each month, but in chunks, right? And really dig in and come prepared ahead of time with our ideas about the categories that we're going to discuss. So what I feel like is happening now, we've, we've talked about several different things, but that doesn't really help us move the, the category, you know, move this forward. Any thoughts on that? How much time do we want to leave before January to work on the specifics of the grant? I mean, do we want to talk about this all the way up until our December meeting? Uh, is the grant due in January? It's due in January. So uh, it's, 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 would city staff actually write the grant or, uh, you know, the yes. grant, you know, I guess is the grant like money that is assured and we just need to decide what we're gonna do with it or is it that we have seven months to come up with a pitch 
to get the money. It's a form of, it's assured and we okay. need to come up with a plan. All right. And just from a city staff perspective, you know, we don't necessarily have grant writing resources. And so I would just like that to be considered in the next topic of conversation. But <laughs> what I think we'll do for now is like Laura suggested, we'll continue to come back and touch on it each meeting. I've heard a lot of energy talk today. So in between now and next meeting, we'll focus on the energy blueprint but we won't exclude anything else, but we'll just start being able to help you more specifically as far as what we need to define within these roadmaps. I sh I'm sure that there are these blueprints. I'm sure that there's some similarities among them all. So we'll start doing that as staff. Yeah, and I'm wondering, Penny, too, if, you know, to some degree, since staff is writing this, you know, if there's already parts that are written that we could then review and comment on and add to, that might be helpful, too, I, I think. Um, how, how does that sound in terms of for your side of it? Um, I'm going to, let me outline the needs first and then I can probably answer that better. Okay. Sounds good. That sounds good. So I think, yeah, we, we ensure that we allot a certain amount of time each meeting to discuss the, the, the topics at hand. Um, and I think that we'll get a lot more done that way than kind of jumping around. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go to the next discussion item for today, which is the full-time staff person process. Uh, Michael, do you want to talk about your discussion and where things stand on your side? And then Penny, if, if you kind of talk through a little bit about um, some of the options that you and Bob discussed as well, then we can take it up from there. All right. Okay. Um, you saw in the minutes that uh, immediately following the last board meeting, I had already made an appointment with Penny and uh, the next day I went in there and we roughed out uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call this? The uh, spending proposal. Um, and then uh, I talked with various people, including yourself, Laura. And, um, and then we finalized that. And then uh, last Thursday, finally, um, I sent that to both Laura and to Penny, also with a, uh, a modified uh, job description. We just cut that a little bit because it, and, uh, and with my understanding that we would then be discussing that further here today. And that's my part of it. Do we have a copy of the new job description? Uh, I just printed out my copy of it, I don't know if the, but there's not extra copies here to be passed around apparently. I can I can pull it up. Yeah, maybe pull it up on the screen. Um, Penny, well, I don't know if you want to have them do this first, or you want to talk to them a little bit about some of the other options that were discussed. So I talked to the manager, and his concern was the ability to fund the position ongoing. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a hundred thousand dollars. You know, it, at the time it was meant to be one time. There wasn't any discussion as to whether or not it would continue. And so the concern being, you know, if we use it for an FTE, a full-time person, you know, what happens after that? I know the group had discussed possibly identifying a grant that could sustain it for multiple years. Um, but, you know, we're not sure necessarily how that would work. So he asked for a couple of other options. The only other options that I could come up with besides a full-time person um, would be a part-time person or an intern, right? Someone who works part-time and then would help us with some of this grant writing that's coming up, including the grant that would sustain the position. Um, and then outside of that would be outsourcing a grant writer to help identify funds for a longer term. Um, something that um, we can either move to next or we can go to the job description is that Michael had identified several cities that do have a sustainability coordinator or officer. So we researched those cities uh, to ask the question, what was the sequence of events? Did they have a plan first and then they got a position and then they got funding or do they have funding and then a plan and a position? You know, what was the order of operation? And so Lisette has um, some research that she can also share with you about how those cities got to a full-time position. I'm sorry, I was trying to pull up the email and I couldn't find it. Do you mind emailing that out? No. Do you want to go ahead and share your email while I do that? Yeah. So I'll pass this out first and then I'll talk about it and then we'll pull it up if I'm on other tabs. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It's all right. 
Come on, hold these big boys. So I was doing some research about different sustainability offices, especially looking at the application, everything that were or the what was submitted by you, Michael. So I was looking at specific cities that were near us that I could find information. Um, so I was looking at specifically at City of Lawrence, Oklahoma City, and Tulsa, which is kind of what I passed out. I was able to actually reach the director of the Office of Sustainability in Lawrence. So I had a quick chat with her this is week. Is that still Jasmine? No, it's wow. actually Kathy, Kathy Richardson. Oh. So she is actually, it's kind of a new office. So the way it happened and the way the office was able to um, become an office in Southeast. So at first, uh, the city of Lawrence developed a climate action plan um, before the director position was even created. So the departments made individual goals and that was kind of brought together to this climate action plan that they wanted to implement. So the director position implemented the goals and came up with the metrics and really brought the departments together. Um, and this is kind of where Kathy comes in. So she is the director of the Office of Sustainability. So it is a newly established office. So previous to this, it didn't have anyone um, specifically for the city of Lawrence. It used to be a joint venture between the city of Lawrence and the county, and the county right. which they paid for 6040. And so at first that was uh, funded through a grant, but they funded it later 4060 split with the county contributing 60 and the city 40. Um, and then this is the first year that the city has funded it full time by themselves. And so that's um, Kathy's position, who I believe she just started um, probably earlier this year. I want to say it was February. I'm not exactly sure. So I was kind of talking to her about, you know, with how this we the board wants to make the position. So she gave me kind of um, how that layout of how that happened in Lawrence. So the position, the board made the recommendation to council um, after they had already had this climate action plan that they wanted to implement. So this kind of, that's where that was born out of. So she recommends that a facilitated goal setting session would be really good for the board because they kind of had a similar, um, with the way the board recommended the position to council. So having a goal setting session with focus two hour discussion of plausible goals. Um, she also cautions that it is difficult to secure funding within the first year um, as a single position. She says, especially with grant cycle issues, if you miss, a cycle you don't get to start again until next year. Um, and then two years might be a little bit more realistic. So having secured funding past the first year, especially with announcing a position with only one year funding, exactly. it might shrink the applicant pool due to job insecurity. Exactly. So they did have the grant funding that allowed them to, so before they even were able to get this position, they had the funding for it through a grant. Um, so then moving on to Oklahoma City, I didn't, I wasn't able to get into contact with anybody there. So same with Tulsa. So it was just kind of what I was able to find online on their websites. So for Oklahoma City, the Office of Sustainability, um, it was founded in 2009 and that was founded through the Energy Efficiency, and Con or it was funded through the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant. Um, so this means that the city got the grant and then they created this office and a position within the office. So they were able to secure 5.4 million um, in funding. And so then the position, um, it, because of this funding, they were able to open the office um, and administer the funds and manage projects and programs. They also, um, since they control the spending of that fund, they also were able to do public and private grants, which uh, were also one to launch new projects and ex add to existing programs. So once they had, once the city got the grant, they were able to fund the position. So they focused on the grant aspect of it first. Um, and city of Tulsa did a similar thing. Um, so they first, well, it was a little different. They first assembled a group of city employees with job duties related to different areas of sustainability that would relate to sustainability, like energy use, water treatment, environmental operations. Um, this team, the ES. ECST focus on developing goals, objectives, and um, strategies for sustainable um, sustainability and energy conservation. So in 2009, they submitted a plan. Um, and through this plan, because of what the mayor saw, she appointed a, a city employee as a special advisor for sustainability. 
Um, this position was only temporary. It was already an existing um, city employee who kind of took on this extra role. And so through the building on the work of the plan that was made by this team, um, they were able to produce a comprehensive outline for sustainability that stretched across all departments, um, include goals and initiatives. And then once the city received, uh, again, from the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant, they were able to um, actually... Uh, the money was used for specifically for energy efficiency and sustainability projects. And then in 2010, um, the mayor established the Office of Sustainability and appointed its first director. Um, it was funded through the EECBG funded uh, projects and included uh, the development of the sustainability plan. Were you able to find out anything about Little Rock or Houston or Kansas City, Missouri? No, I did look at their pages and they weren't really helpful about the history of how they kind of came to be. I got really lucky, I think, with Oklahoma City and Tulsa and I tried to contact someone hmm. at Kansas City and I never got a reply back. Same with Norman, Oklahoma. And then I think I tried to call someone at Little Rock as well. I sent a couple emails, but um, this, right. it has kind of all started this week. So I was really happy to get in contact with um, Kathy Richardson. She was actually giving me a call back and I had a nice meeting with her and Great. she was kind of giving... Uh, her explanation of how things happened. So could we potentially write this into the block grant that we're trying to work with you on anyway? Is that what I'm what I'm hearing? A low to light, knowledgeable activity in the energy planning, if that was an area of focus that we decided to work on. Sorry, say that again. I, I can't say for sure, but it sounds like it would fit into the energy planning focus area and we can do a deep dive to make sure that's true. Yeah, I mean, if, if we could, if we could, again, kind of use the funding we have to get someone going, but then know that we could write that into the block grant that we're going to be helping you with anyway, there's our, there's at least a potential solution to this from a long term sustainability standpoint. I think it's interesting to note also that all three of those stories talk about they, they had a plan and then they moved forward on their plan. We already have a plan. EFC has given us a plan. We can use that and put someone to work immediately. Is the, the block grant, is that something that the city gets every year and we always get that number? And this is the first year, and it's from the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So um, that's why it's a block grant, but it sounds like with those amounts, it sounds like it's a fairly consistent grant, and it's and they have some big amounts in there. So I think yeah. this block grant was allocated. There's probably more competitive grants that we could look for in the future. You know, if we are able to use this for a position, and that position probably keeps looking back to this program for other opportunities. And it's my understanding that the Little Rock position uh, also started with limited funding and then continued to find grants to keep that going. So, I mean, there's that scenario, which is this is part of as well. We did at one point have a position like this in Wichita. Um, it was grant funded. And when the grant expired, the person had to leave. But um, Kay did a lot of stuff, and I got Kay to know Johnson. her there. Yeah, yeah. Um, she's in Lawrence now. Um, but I don't know how, what grant it was that got that. I can ask her where mm. that money came from. Um, but we've had something like that here before. I just found a little um, freebie that she gave out at a sustainability conference that she put on that was. At Century 2, it filled up the entire building. It was the coolest thing ever. When and the weather it? was really, really, really bad. And so nobody came. I mean, it was really bad, um, like tornadoes and everything. But it was the, it, it, she had so many vendors, so many different sustainability people that had just come to that. Okay. Even if we could figure out a way to do something like that, I think that would be super cool. Um, but we'd have to have city facility to let us use to try to plan something like that. But she did a lot while she was here, but that's been- It's been 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's been, been at least 10 it's years been ago. been that long. Oh. I yeah. know, I think it's been at least 10 when I mean, yeah. I used to, we were at the sustainability conferences and worked with uh, Kay here. So I, it's yeah. been a while. Yeah. I think it's probably been that long, yeah. Well, it's overdue but, that you can get back to this. But I don't remember what our time is. What I'm thinking or, is if we can give kind of a runway to someone, you know, okay. So, the, the money that we have with ours, um, if we could 
use some of the block grant money towards it. Um, and then they have time to, you know, get more grants and, and find there's, and there's going to be more, right? I mean, this isn't going away. This isn't a trend that's going to stop anytime soon. Um, so to me, this seems like this might be, and that maybe not the only strategy, but a strategy for us to pursue in terms of making this a, a sustainable position, you know, and write that into this block grant from the get-go. Def definitely. That sounds like something to work for. But uh, with regards to the position itself, um, is there any reason why we should not continue with what we have already voted on? Uh, well, I think I think what, what Penny's saying is that the, the city itself is going, and Penny, please correct me if I'm not saying this correctly, but the city itself has to approve this position. And the concern is how how is this going to, how, how are we going to ensure this isn't a one-year deal for someone, right? That it is a, a sustainable position from a financial standpoint. Um, so that's why this is important to figure out, okay, let's plan on writing this into the block grant so that we know that gives us, you know, more of a runway, gives that person more of a runway to find more money to sustain their own job, whether that's through additional grants or through savings through the city. But that's what we have to help them figure out is how is this actually financially sustainable in the long run. Um, and I think if it's a full time to start, that's one option. If it's a part time to start, that's another option. But those are some of the things that we need to be figuring out and, and helping the city figure out in order to make this a reality. Absolutely, because it's all about priorities in how money is spent. It's really that simple. Six million dollars for pickleball courts, and we're asking for a fraction of that, a very small fraction, for a full-time position, 24-25. With the budget we have, we can initiate this and get it started. And we can, with if they just approve for 24-25, uh, the caliber and, like you say, the, the list of people that would apply for that Anyone considering moving their family to Wichita, for example, is not going to get very excited about a one-year position. If they see that there's multiple years that the city is taking this very serious and is committed to this, then uh, serious professionals will step up. That's my view of it. Anyone else like to express their opinion? I think that's true. Um, I spoke with Councilman um, Johnson and Councilwoman Tuttle about this at the um, Plastic Bag Task Force meeting last week. Um, Lori was there as well. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to stress in order to get this pushed through is that this position would actually save money. Because one of the issues that, um, of course, the, that the city is now contending with is a budget shortfall of a couple years from now and already looking to prepare for that, right? So the counter argument against us right now is, well, we're trying to cut expenses, not add them. However, if we can show that this would actually be part of the solution to cutting expenses, that's an argument worth making. And, and I could see the light bulb go off in both of their faces with that, but that's the argument. And it, but we have to have data behind that, right? So if we're saying as a sustainability board, hey, we're gonna use our funds for the first year um, to fund this, we're also looking at this block, you know, funding it through the block grant for at least, you know, another year or two after that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, by the end of that, you know, time frame, this person will be able to find Johnny. No, this that this person will be able to, um, you know, find savings for the city. Then there's a really strong argument for this, right? That's it's it's got to come from that direction in order to get this passed. Absolutely. Cody says yes, Laura. <laughs> um, any other any other comments on that? And and then, um, but I, I do think that you know figuring out now how to add this into the block grant is going to be a priority for us getting this pushed. <clears throat> what is the the language that would need to be researched? for us to put it into the block grant. I mean, do, do we just have to come up with a job description? Uh, you know, do we have to establish, you know, like some specific 
you know, measurements that would be, you know, used to assess the person hired after, you know, a year or, uh, I mean, it, what you're saying makes perfect sense to me. And it aligns with, you know, the information that, you know, has been presented from other cities where, mm -hmm. you know, you have a variety of different paths that are taken, but, you know, with the exception of Tulsa, you know, it's, it's not something that, you know, the city is directly involved in from the get go. You know, there has to be, uh, you know, action taken to begin, you know, something rolling forward. So that the city sees, oh, that this is something that benefits us. So let's start funding this over the long term. So, what do we need to actually say in uh, the block grant to get this thing going? Is that a paint question for Penny? I'm going to look at this grant. Quite honestly, I was going to ask the technical assistants if I can use the grant funding grantee. So we'll see what they say. There you go. I'm just going to ask because it looks like if you say you're going to develop an energy plan, which I hear what you're saying, we have the EFC report. But to me, that's like a universe of options, right? But a plan is much more focused. Is like this is our area, this is our objective, you know, and here's our here's how we're going to get there. And so if we say, hey, we're going to use SFE to put this energy plan together and conserve X by this year, then maybe that's an eligible use. I'm just going to ask. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like a good start. I'd like to remind everyone. Uh, we went before the city council 27 times or we wouldn't even be here tonight having a sustainability board and uh, they are amenable or whatever you want to call it they respond to public opinion it's my understanding right now that the current budget 24 25 that they're looking at is is they are responding to survey results that they want to but they're responding to public opinion. And if we um, went before them and, and presented the data, which is what Russell's talking about, we could argue those points. I don't think we should uh, give up at all what we're asking for because it's the right thing to do. And there are ways, the block grant is a good way to go forward on it. And uh, I, I think we should continue to argue for the full-time position going forward. That's my statement. What, what I would recommend is, since Elizabeth has started some really great research on um, some of the other cities around us, if we could also ask her to look into what over the years can these offices point to in, in terms of what they have saved their respective cities. Okay. Um, that would be sure. very valuable research to understand and, and know. Um, you know, so if they have an office that's spending two million a year, whatever, I'm just making this up, right? But um, but the savings of the city are, you know, are 20 million, again, making up numbers, right? I mean, that that's a story to tell, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so understanding, you know, from our neighboring cities, how this all looks absolutely would be really beneficial. And if, and if that's what they're doing, right? If what are they doing yeah. annually? What are they reporting based mm -hmm. on, you know, it may be that because it's grant funded, they're not reporting savings. They're, I don't know, but it would be interesting. What are their goals as a position that keeps them relevant in that city? What are they expected to accomplish? And how are they expected to support that with the data? It's I, probably different based on each city's priorities, but- I have zero doubt. Yeah. 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 doubt that if we can ever examine the data and the costs all the way around in all the different areas that the sustainability officer or coordinator would uh, be involved with that there would definitely be savings that would pay for that position many times over but to penny's point or not to penny's point to tammy's point let's find out right like let's ask yeah, the absolutely. question right. yeah what is let's have several examples from other cities and several examples of how they did it too right so what what did they do in their respective cities that uh, that both created good environmental programs, but also saved the city money at the exact same moment of doing it. Right. That's what we need to know. And that's what we need to be able to present. Um, and of course, our plan is to how we're giving this person a runway enough to be able to self-fund effectively, right? That's, those are, to me, those are the, the questions that the city cares about likely and wants to have answered. 
Right. I'd like to ask okay. a couple of questions regarding the uh, the budget that we're talking about using for to fund this position initially. How long <laughs> are those budgeted funds available? Is there a deadline for use? End of the year. December 31st. Okay. I mean, that's what they're programmed for if you want to ask for them to move, you know, and, and it was initially set up as a project budget, which in the city speak is different than an operating budget. It was meant for like, you know, if you want to buy a solar panel or if you want to, you know, like these projects that you've been discussing. That's why I think there's a possibility that it rolls if you ask, but right. um, it's programmed for this year. Okay, so just like the block grant, it's nothing we need to decide tonight. Right? Another question I'd like to ask regarding the uh, 24 and 25 budget discussions. Can, do you know which uh, budget meetings dates or that are in the future where they will allow public input? Um, no, but I'll find it. There was a workshop yesterday, so I can find that for you. Real quick. Thank you. I had heard that we're going to have to cut our budget by fourteen million dollars. Which begs the question: Why would you spend six million dollars on pickleball courts? Demand. I, I would just say, while we're talking tactics, in general, grants, <coughs> grant providers, and I suspect the block grant people are the same, are more inclined to give a grant to somebody who has exhibited, to an applicant who has exhibited some sort of commitment ahead of time. So along with the... Um, long-term financial advantages to the city, I think we also need to make the case that the city needs to show that they have some sort of commitment to this whole long-term idea if we want the Black Grant people to take our application seriously. Right. So, so this could actually be part of that. And we also have the research that which Shaw State did. Yeah. yeah, in that report too, that has cost benefit knowledge. Yeah, the issue is in there. That we can use for reasons. So, what, yep. what's the next step for next month, Laura? Well, I guess I mean I think it'd be really helpful um, if Elizabeth can continue her research for us, and, and if anyone on the board can help with that. Um, you know, in terms of creating that argument, um, and then kind of another piece in between is understanding from the block grant, you know, how maybe that was written in by other places, you know, so I don't remember if it was Tulsa or Oklahoma City, but um, the the place that that used it in the first place, how did they do that? How did they write it in in the first place? Those types of research items. Um, and then we can take that back, not necessarily even in this meeting, but we can take that back to the city manager and say, hey, this is what we've learned. This is how we would, in theory, like to, to have this be more financially sustainable over time. I think that can be done between now and, and the next meeting, um, but that's what I would do. Yeah, and then we can focus more of our energies here on the other parts of the block grant um, and any other projects that we want to want to discuss and maybe take on, depending on how that all goes. So I'm sorry, I have to ask for clarification. So the block grant either all goes to fund this position, like we say, this is what our priority is with this block grant, or you're saying it would be multiple, like we want a position, but we want projects to both. Is it both? I think I think the grant can be both, right? It's, okay. it's, it's enough of a one, I believe. Okay. Hey, what's what's the amount? 350. 350. Yeah. So that what was, was it? my thought was if it if it was all went to a position, at least you know you have funding for a few years. And I think what I've heard, what I feel like that position is takes priority over a lot of other projects. And that if we know if we could get that position, ultimately that's the long win, maybe not be the short win, but it is the long win. So I, I wonder I if you're trying to divide it too thinly if you don't focus on one, but I, hear that. I don't know. Um, Penny, I, didn't, I couldn't hear your answer in terms of how much the block grant was for. 381,000. Oh, it's not that much. So yes, I agree with what Tammy just said. So maybe that's maybe that is the play is that we we ask for that money for this, and then and then Absolutely. that person goes yeah. and finds other grants and whatnot to fund actual projects. Yeah, and I, I would be happy to volunteer to help uh, Elizabeth do additional research on these positions. 
to present back to the group or city manager as appropriate. How do others in the room feel about using the, the you know the block grant for this purpose solely? Does that make sense to everybody? It sounds good in theory, but many times grants don't go for operating costs. So we would need to know that. Right. And yeah, I, I mean, that was, she said. That she was, was the whole out. point yeah. of asking whether or not yeah. we can build it into the plan. So let's right. establish that. And if we find out that it is in fact doable, then let's debate whether or not we want to use the full uh, block grant to try to push this effort forward, which I think is some is, I mean, if we could get this, I think it would have a tremendous multiplying effect. Right. But Absolutely. if it's not going to be available through the grant, because we're not going to be able to write some kind of verbiage that talks about plan creation, that would include the hiring of someone to execute the plan, then we have to start looking at other ways right. to achieve this. Right. But for now, let's find out if it's even possible. So yep, perfect. Would you be able to send that out to everybody before the next meeting so we would know yes or no what the? Can I get a response? Yeah, I'll email them tomorrow. Yeah. And we'll so that way, uh, you know, we would, you know, come to the meeting and already have that knowledge rather than starting mm -hmm. brand new. Are the the grant proposals available on the CB? I can't get all the initials right. Website. The proposals like the application or the yeah the previous applications from other cities like i mean we have you've tracked down some cities if we could say for instance get our hands on a copy of tulsa's application and see what they said i haven't seen that yet but i'll look for it sometimes grantors make the grant proposals public and sometimes they don't but if they do that would be a really good resource sounds good so we have about 20 minutes left um, in the meeting. So I'd like to open that up for public comment at the point. Um, do we have anyone in the room or online who would like to make a comment? Uh, yes, this is Jane Burns. I wanted to tell you that I sat in on the Kansas Department of Transportation um, webinar today to invite, to announce their Kate, Kansas Alternate Transportation, Kansas Active Transportation Enhancement. Um, that, that uh, in the WSU EFC um, recommendations, there's a very high return on cost benefit for alt active transportation for enabling walkability, bikeability, and other modes of transportation. Yep. Um, so uh, Kansas, uh, the Kansas Department of Transportation is giving active transportation $2 million a year, a year to develop um, those plans, bike lanes, walkability. Um, so um, they, they call it, walk, bike, roll. Um, it's everything from um, um, uh, mobility <coughs> issues uh, just to uh, um, facilitating um, active transportation uh, to save car mileage and, and fossil fuel usage. Um, they've done a crash analysis, for example, that's on their line, on their uh, website that um, uh, figures the cost of killing and injuring, either in minor ways or serious ways, the cost to the taxpayer for crashes so that safety is being felt, um, uh, being regarded uh, more uh, uh, respectfully throughout the whole transportation network. Um, so that's A, active transportation. B, it is not on the list of EFC stuff at all, but um, in my um, estimation, trash reduction is something that's important for the future. Uh, we, uh, Lori, I, and two other people went to the city council in September of 2019. That's years ago, lots of progress the the system the single use plastic plastic bag task force recommended 
unequivocally to ban single use plastic bags. The uh, city council heard that recommendation on um, February 28th. You remember that Brett Prather came here and gave that wonderful presentation. Um, anyway, the city council blew it up. I mean, this climb to respond. <laughs> <laughs> There's a huge, over, I mean, I kind of looked that up, a whole lot of um, media input at every step of the way over these many years. But last night there was um, um, a, an ABC sort of special investigation that plastics really aren't um, recycled much. Plastic They're bags. very well, and plastics in general. Okay. <clears throat> Definitely single use plastic bags. They're incinerated. <laughs> They're shipped to KAKE locally, was part of that. And um, the, 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 the whole project was to um, track ac actual uh, disposition of these uh, single use plastic bags that, that are put into Target recycling bins and Walmart. Anyway, one of the ones from Wichita ended up in Malaysia. I mean, there is no consistent um, uh, <clears throat> disposition or environmental usage. Um, and two of them went to the Plum Thicket landfill. Landfill. Um, in other words, I personally plan to go back to the city council to ask again for a ban on single-use plastic bags. And some of the, the ones that are incinerated uh, are in neighborhoods that have something like five times as much asthma as anybody else. <laughs> that particulation, particulates um, uh, exacerbate breathing and, uh, and our environmental concern in air quality. I don't know how that's measured, but uh, certainly that's an issue, especially in low-income areas. Um, so thank you. Are there any other questions? <laughs> thank you for listening. Thanks, Jay. Mm -hmm. CJ? Okay. okay. Uh, so I'm sorry, it's not interested for public comment, more in between your agenda points. So I'm sorry if this is exhaustive um, in both ways. Um, there, there was a discussion about uh, some of the benefits from some of the, I believe there's energy efficiency conservation block grants. Uh, landlords couldn't be targeted um, with one, or I'm sorry, that homeowners only could be targeted. Actually, those block grants, from what I understand about them, the talks with Columbia graduate students, you can actually target renters with some of those grants, um, just point blank. But also, this would be a good time to target landlords. Uh, Hutchinson, obviously, is a city that has had a wicked problem with landlords itinerant and otherwise not taking care of properties. Um, this is an opportunity for the city to get on top of what some would call urban blight and slumlording. Um, so this is a great time to work with them instead of just come after them, um, which was what got Hutch City Council in a bit of trouble there. Now then you have your community solar. Uh, yeah, it's pity Kent isn't here tonight. Um, Kent is all about it at Kent Rome. Um, and as he points out in all of his visual aids, you can put them on the ground. So the structure of the roof isn't as big of a deal. You got people trying to put poles on the top of their apartment complex. We got bigger problems going on roofs. Uh, but what barriers would need to be directly dismantled to overcome or allow for the program in the most disadvantaged areas? Because let's stop looking at this as a ooh, cool amenity and a thing that we can add to condominiums. And how about we start looking at this as adding it to Section 8 housing? If you want to rent Section 8 housing here in the city of Wichita, you need to have a backup plan for when the gas goes out. This is your backup plan. If you have somebody with over X amount of units, X amount of residents, it, it's simple enough. And 40% of the tasks go low income communities anyway. So let's attack the root where the most disadvantaged populations are. Those most disadvantaged people typically in America are poor. So let's, Section 8 is where they live. That's why we said it. Let's attack that first and foremost. And the best way to do that as well, public services uh, that uh, the, uh, the disadvantaged communities, people of color and low income people use, as well as Section 8 landlords with specified numbers of units or residents that aren't using Section 8. That's totally something the city could regulate. Faith-based institutions could be directly worked with for 
for some of these grants as well. That is specified just as much as residential uh, 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 homeowners. So uh, the, the other thing here is the Solarize KC is a really great example of what happens when you pick winners and losers. When there's only one company, right? There's no impetus for the community to really gather around this. Um, if you want to train the workforce, we have places that train electricians and engineers here in this community. I mean, from the technicians themselves, to the people that design systems, we have WSU EFC at our disposal. Training the workforce now should be a priority so that we can rapidly solarize and electrify our communities. Uh, as well, the workforce development, just, it can't be as important as community disaster resiliency. So if we need to import the workers from out of state, um, like we're talking about with one single position, maybe it's time to start looking at ways to import those workers that can help solarize and electrify our communities as we don't want to end up like Texas when that snowstorm hits us next, right? Now, going down to the long here, just take a lesson from your rural social work. Make sure that there is outreach to show that there is a benefit. Encourage early adopters to share their story through your social media for your city. Enough said. Uh, people can get an extra 50 bucks to do something that benefits them. No one likes to mix oil and gas. No one likes to fill up a gas canister when they can simply plug something in. There, there's benefits for people, but we have to actually encourage them to do it. Just like getting people to stop using big manure and start using fossil fuel tracked fertilizers and pesticides, right? So we just need to do that basic strategy that WSG taught me how to do along with every other city master's communication scheme that I saw go through that program. Um, commercial landscapers with over a certain number of employees should just be required to participate and electrify their tools. No one on a construction site has ever complained to me that, ah, oh, man, it's too bad I can't use my gas-powered impact driver, right? If people can do it on a construction site where oftentimes there isn't a source of electricity outside of a generator and people literally get in fist fights over an electrical outlet, I, I really do believe that we can ask people who work just in commercial residences or, or uh, commercial or residential landscaping to simply do this. And the client themselves can just, they can just put into their new contract, hey, the client needs to pay for the electricity. This is part of the cost of, the, of, of your facility. Therefore, why not include that in the contract? As well, uh, it's a great care for commercial landscapers to just electrify their tools, just requiring contractors that do the 80% of work for the city to take care of the landscaping to, to, to do that. Don't reward people who aren't going with this flow. That's the number one reason why there's extra money for us. And you can not only have a carrot, but a stick, right? And the stick you. alone makes you look bad. Carrot and stick, we're going to go with it. Your sustainability officer program. This is where most of my comments are really directed because I feel this is most important. Uh, there is the concern that if you only give a year of funding, um, that you won't be able to attract people um, who can build it. In other words, there is a notion that if you fund it, people who come, or pe people who come will be better. What I'm saying is, if you if you simply ask for it, you should get the right people. Anybody who in this current fiduciary and, and, and budgetary climate. Uh, especially given, uh, uh, I'll bring something up here from a call I was just on with the EPA over Zoom this afternoon. Uh, WSU is is no longer on track to be. They now are one of the thriving communities technical assistance centers in thriving communities grant writing program. They currently are helping people write phase one, and that's where we're at as a community assessment programs for one year for 150k. You now have the ability to fund that. If you want to move on to phase two, a planning project, $250,000 for one to two years. Phase three, project development, $350,000 for two years. I'm sorry, but if you give somebody one year of funding to work on this with an organization that's down the street and has massive amounts of funding to assist with environmental justice grant writing, managing federal grants, ID funding sources at the federal, local, and private level, navigating SAM.gov and grants.gov. Uh, with nonprofits. I mean, they're literally there to help funnel millions of dollars at our community. If you cannot find somebody with one year of funding that has the talent to do this, you're not looking for the right people. Because anybody that's currently doing this work would look at this opportunity and be like, cool, I just funded a career in one year. It's really not that difficult. Um, the difference between the communities that didn't call back, though, when you were doing your research and the communities uh, uh, like communities like ours is that they currently have people that are too busy to answer a call about this because they are actively taking advantage of these grants through WSU EFC, even here in Region 7 for the EPA. So they're so busy 
talking to people over at WSU, funneling money from that organization the city has funded so much into their communities outside of Wichita, they don't have time to talk to us because that's what the environment looks like. I don't work anything less than 50 hours a week right now, and that's working for nonprofits because there's so much money in this, and it's the first time in heck, my entire life that I've ever seen this much popular and federal support for these programs. So really, who's going to administer the grants that you guys want to write? Well, it's probably going to be the person that writes them. And if they write enough grants that they can't administer all of them, then you hire more people. It's, it's that simple. Who's going to be collaborating with your stakeholders to make sure that you meet your CDO requirements, both the person that you hire, right? That's why these people are too busy to call you back. And it, who should examine the savings generated by all of this? Who should the cost, what, what programs can be cut, right? The simple answer is the person that you attract by saying, we need someone who really wants to do this work we're going to fund your position for a year. We need you to be able to fund it for future years by writing a grant. If you build it, they will come, right? In this case, it's simply if you ask for it, right? And you don't give them an easy ticket to sit on their laurels and twiddle their thumbs, you're going to get what you want. Because right now it's totally possible for anyone with the initiative to do it that would show up. So how do you ensure this is more than a one-year deal for some? Fund it with the existing opportunities we have from a technical assistance center in our backyard. It's that simple. We've got everything here to do it. It's, it's a, only a matter of whether or not this board exercises the political capital it has from the 27 attendances to <laughs> city council meeting and says, like Bartleby Scrivener, no, thank you. I'd rather not. I'd rather not ask every community in America about their experiences. I'd rather not uh, run more surveys and find out because if you ask people what they want and they literally say pickleball, then their priorities are out of whack and it's the time that a community leaders step up and say, hey, <laughs> let's not be underwater. Let's not be uh, notorious for asthma, for air cancer, or, or, I'm sorry, air toxic cancers, right? Let's not be that community and be the community that funds one of these positions like Lawrence. What's the difference between them and us? Political capital and power. So exercise it. That's all I'm asking. Props for the Herman Melville quotation. <laughs> Thank, you, sir. Thank, you. Thank you very much. CJ. Oh, and last but not least, if you would like uh, this Saturday, we've got a vote and block party. It's going to be through my organization, SNEC. And then as well, I am running a monthly transit equity meeting, trying to get more access to public transportation. We've got a lot of great ideas. So I'm trying to talk to my people at the city. I'm hopefully we'll hear back soon. <laughs> but we do have a monthly meeting every month, third Thursday. Uh, this is going to be on uh, June the 15th, if anyone would like to come, at Pawnee and Ida, uh, 10 16. All right. Thank you very much. Laura, Thank do you, you. want to? Um, do we have any? We got three minutes left. Any last minute comments? I would yeah. just like to share a uh, someone on the board. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, hi, it's Elizabeth Fenner. I am calling in from Los Angeles and I was there. I know Mike well. I know Jane well. I worked with 316 um, uh, United and uh, and Regreening Wichita. Uh, so I'm glad to be with you and I'll be with you again. I'm real invested in Wichita. You have a, an awesome place. Uh, I'm sorry that I wasn't here for the whole thing, so maybe I missed some stuff, but it's very dry. It's very dry. And I guess I would just say, I recommend that the board um, uh, get, get a little wetter, get a little bit closer to the people and to what the people are talking about. Um, when I was with 316 and I was doing every kind of trash pickup, every kind of you know activity, and you guys were mysterious. Who's the board? Who are they? Where do they go? What's what? What are they doing? So part of what I'd like to see you use with that 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 staff position, which is fantastic, is to increase your brand. I'd like to see you know uh, t-shirts, and I'd like to see you guys out there and say, "Oh, you're on the board. That's what the board does." Um, and so just doing um, like. Right, doing things that people say, oh yeah, that's what the board does. That's what the board stands for. And you won't get survey numbers. I mean, survey's a survey, right? But you'll get anecdotes and you'll get people who say, ah, this is what I want. 
and then you'll be able to you'll be able to be that interface between the city and um, and the people and that's a good in both ways because you'll give you'll give politicians something to brag about because they'll hear your story about somebody who who put in five community gardens and I I've heard about it it's it's happening and that politician is saying here in Wichita the mo one of the most livable cities in the United States is doing this and we're doing this we heard about it from the sustainability board. Um, I'll, I'll be with you again and I'll say this, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read the same script again, but um, we've, I think we invited all of you guys to a couple of events and we, you were going to be our special, you know, guests that we were going to bring up and, and cheer for because we know that you're doing the hard work. The library will close in 15 minutes. <laughs> I used to work for the library. I was in the Rockwell branch. And thank you so much. Stations to assist. Please save all documents and complete all printing at this time. I'm going to let them finish. This being the Wichita Public Library. Great. <laughs> Just one, one quick thing. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I received an email from Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, she uh, mentioned that uh, she has found some uh, USDA funding that the deadline for application is June 1st, and that is two and a half million dollars for trees. And it would be really nice to try to take advantage of this, uh, especially for underserved areas, which uh, this NASA heat study that I'm sure we will discuss more. Uh, something that could be very good for Wichita. And um, so anyway, I mentioned that to be part of the record. Is it June 1st next week? That's right. I'll, I'll <laughs> more on that later. Laura. <laughs> All right. Thank, thanks, everybody. Um, well, we are at time. So I am, unless we have any last minute comments, I am going to call this meeting to adjourn. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming, being part of this. This is 